This is Vancouver's Chinatown. This historic neighborhood is 130 years in the making, and like all of its kind, it is home to generations of immigrants, historic landmarks, and of course, staple restaurants. This is Han's One Ton House. Hans has been open since 1972. This is Hans' current general manager. Hmm, this makes me wonder, how does the cultural politics of food shape the formation of Vancouver's Chinatown's communal identity through intimacy? That's a good question. Oh, look at this. Did you know that many menus have explanations of Chinese culture, but to first better understand the intimacy of food and its impacts on the communal identity of Vancouver's Chinatown, one must understand how Chinatown came to be. Today, Vancouver's Chinatown is Canada's largest Chinatown. However, during the gold rush, it was just developing. From the late 1880s, the enclave of Chinese settlement at Vancouver's Pender Street was an important site through which white society's concept around Chinese were constituted and reproduced. In 1890 to 1920, Chinese immigrants settled in Shanghai Alley and Canton Alley. At this time, Shanghai Alley was home to more than 1,000 Chinese residents. What's important to understand is that the Chinese community was forced to create Chinatown by Vancouver's municipal government. This was not a choice or desire, but rather segregation. Within Chinatown, restaurants and places of food sharing flourished as sites of community development and connections. And as a result, these restaurants became a location of Chinese diaspora culture and continues to be so today. In this sense, one might view the restaurant as a quasi-community center. Food as a medium for intimacy creates a complex relationship between an individual and a culture. Within migrant communities, food consumption can be just as much about maintaining connections of home as about creating community amongst a group of people. It is a place to share stories, build relationships, and strengthen community ties. Seen from this perspective, intimacy might be thought of less as the sexual, romantic, and conjugal relations, and more of an interaction between kinship and community. Food can be a catalyst in creating community ties and strengthening both familial and kinship bonds. Chinese restaurants resemble a larger and inclusive home. It is a place where families and friends can interact within and amongst themselves over food. The dining room of a restaurant then acts as a living room where one would host guests. Sensory notes on how the culturally constructed aspects of materiality related to meal selection, preparation, and consumption are especially important to Chinese. Single food items can play a profound role in the construction of group identities since migrant communities are often logistically restricted to subset of ingredients, as seen in the creation of Chinatown. Foodscapes of human relationships can signal rank, rivalry, solidarity and community, identity or exclusion, and intimacy or distance. The intimacy shared between two individuals need not be regionally exclusive. In fact, restaurants work to create a cluster of cultural knowledge and practices that are theoretically mobile. Sharing meals, snacks, and cooking practices not only reinforces the cultural identity of the individual sharing and celebrating their cultural roots, but also extends their culture to others as well. Food describes a community of culture generated by material interactions. We can learn about the experiences of Chinese people in Vancouver's Chinatown at this time by studying the ways that individual Chinese populations have adapted their food ways to local conditions.
A material of Chinese food culture that evolved as a result of segregation are menus of Chinese restaurants. The changes seen in these menus over time reflect the diasporic nature of Chinese culture in Vancouver's Chinatown. The community was cut off and isolated from Greater Vancouver while it was simultaneously forced to adapt an Anglo-Canadian culture to meet customer needs. Historical menus often included sections in English that transcribed Chinese culture. Some examples include the Chinese art of eating, the story of chopsticks, the symbolic expressions of well wishes. Dishes that were preferred by Anglo Canadians were highlighted or bolded. These are tangible examples of the negotiation between assimilation and dissimilation at this time. Intimacy must follow the predetermined conditions of post colonial exchanges and work to enforce the interested networks of globalization with all of its economics, ecological, and informational concern. As a result, the style of Chinese restaurant food in the West changed rapidly, adapting to the local environment and subject to innovation such as the invention of chop suey. This change is a reflection of the politics shaping the communal identity of Chinatown. Imogene Lim, the collector of these Chinatown menus, notes on how Chinese menus in Canada reflect the interplay between Chinese culture and Canadian culture. The restaurateur is adapting to the community and everyone is coming in halfway. Yet, the Chinese community neither opts to assimilate within such a structure nor strictly opposes it. Rather, this identification is a strategy that works on and against dominant ideology. The Chinese restaurant functions as an illuminating locus of the old and the new diasporas. The proprietor's persistent identification and problemization of Chineseness far from anything else that might be recognized as Chinese. This suggests that diasporic formations can also be incredibly lonely and isolating, even if they are bound by notions of community. Food seen as too spicy, too weird, or too oriental added to the anti Chinese movement at this time. The same food that connected the community within Chinatown and catered to the needs of those outside of Chinatown was also the basis for persecution against Chinese people, isolating those within Chinatown farther from diverse community expansion. The historical racialization of Chinese diasporic intimacies marks the collective ways by which race becomes included within the private domain of private family and kinship today. This comes only through the active management, suppression, and sublimination of other accesses of social differences, as seen through the creation of Chinatown. In 1971, Chinatown was designated as a heritage district, and today, Chinatown is an accepted part of the urban landscape and provides a space of consumption and amusement. To ethically engage in this consumption and interact with Chinatown's communal identity, one must understand that a menu is more than just a menu. Chinatown is more than just the location in Vancouver, and the community within it shares a unique pattern of intimacy shaped by the past. How will you interact with the restaurants in Vancouver's Chinatown? <laughs>